article describe conditions for Florence. So here we have Florence being shown around, and these people here are, are describing to her the conditions that are in the hospital. They're describing what they're up against. So they're using and applying what they've learned, and they're developing that knowledge in this process. And she's asking questions. She's their teacher. So she's, she's playing the game. She's lowering, deliberately lowering her um, position in the classroom in the same way as I did for AP for a learning experience. And then she's extending the children's learning by questioning them and by challenging them. And the third picture is a picture that's later on in the story, after Florence's reforms have taken hold. And it's a team of experts now who are using the things that she's taught them to make Scutari much more, a much safer and more effective hospital. <coughs> that's basically, that's the map of the expert process in three photographs. It's a journey, it's a story <coughs> that the children are involved in. Taking the curriculum, the story of Florence Nightingale, the learning objectives that you want from Florence, and putting them in a story. But that's not, that's not the end of it. Because the children are now fully engaged in this experience. So now, the story, so now we can use that, exploit it if you like, in order to teach much wider areas of the curriculum. So the teacher has planned this out. So this is just a, a sample, there's, just a, there's a long list, not so many years. But we can ask the children to write letters home from the point of view of those who were in Scutari before <coughs> and after the change for letter writing activities, literacy, to know, to know how, but it's contextualised. A report can be written from the team to Florence detailing the changes that have been initiated. Maps. The team can draw maps, and this is all happening in the outer circle, but it's all got meaning and purpose in the inner circle, um, for detailing the terrain and areas of conflict for when the team are out in the field. So you can teach the geography curriculum to do it. If you'd like pamphlets, detailing first aid and health advice to soldiers is for people who don't understand about those things. If you'd like charts on the walls of the hospital with information about the human body, major organs, circulation and skeleton, sign. If you'd like information posters, reminding people in the hospital about the importance of cleanliness and the risks of infection. So all the time the teacher is thinking to herself, what's the curriculum that I want the kids to learn? How can I use the context in order to teach it? Which bits do I need to teach outside of fiction and which bits of the thing are inside the fiction? But that's not going to be everything that she teaches. Some bits of the curriculum are not going to fit and it would be wrong to kind of force them in, you know, in some kind of bizarre sort of you know, um, activities that, that kind of are associated but don't really work, are even coherent. It doesn't do that. You teach those things discreetly. So if you ask teachers who have been using Matthew Expert for a while, they're probably teaching about 60 to 80% of the curriculum through Math the Expert, and 40, 50%, depending on you know, what's going on, and that has nothing to do with that context. It's completely uh, different outside of that. So it's, it's bow bang rather than eye of This isn't a, a way of teaching the whole of the curriculum. It wouldn't work that way. It wouldn't be designed to work that way. <coughs> so this is, this is the last quote from Dorothy Hefkirk. Um, Dorothy said that the problem with classrooms is they're a little bit like waiting rooms. And what she meant by that was that waiting rooms are places where people wait and the things that the children are learning are going to be useful to them, but not today. They're going to be useful to them at some time in the future. Um, so what she said was she, want, what she wanted was classrooms to be more like labs. By that she means places of experiment where you're working with children and they're contributing and bringing things in, their knowledge and their responsibility. And she said, she had, she had a big claim. She claimed that 
But those kinds of things could be cells for changing society and make a big difference to how society operates. So, if I go back to the photograph. How are we doing for time? We've got ten minutes. Good. So I was going to stop at that point because um, too much talking, and I was going to ask. So, are you, are you asking how much of the curriculum do we yeah. teach in this way? I, I would, it, going back to the know-how and know-what, if, if we're looking at literacy, almost all of the literacy can be taught through Math the Expert in application. But obviously we have discrete lessons for things like phonics and then other types of activities, reading, all sorts of things, which are not part of the context. They're taught separately and discreetly. Mathematics is another one. But we look, obviously, as often as we can, for op opportunities to apply those things. But it's a, it's a kind of developmental thing. The more you sort of use it, the more you can bring things in. Because things, things are connected, aren't they? And the connections are strong connections. So the more you become connected, the more you can use those things. So I'd say when I first started, I'd do maybe an afternoon a week, just until I got a hang of it. Because there's quite a lot of drama strategies that you have to learn. And I wasn't a drama teacher. Um, but gradually, over the time, it sort of crept up until now, I'd say about 80%. Something like that. We don't force them. Is this applicable to A levels? Sorry? Can this be made applicable to A levels, considering the fact that a lot of students, by the time they get to A level, they've lost a certain amount of imagination? Yeah. Well, it, w it seems to work. <laughs> See, I'm going to be I'm going to be really quite sort of um, reticent here because it, it it seems to work for everybody. Now I can say that with some confidence because I've seen it work with all different age groups and all different settings. But the the issue really is around systems because it takes time, and if you're working in short lesson where you're working on 40 minute lessons and then everybody moves on and then there's another 40 minutes and you don't see the children for two weeks, then it's very difficult to build up something like this in terms of the context. My, my experience is almost exclusively in primary. Um, there are people um, who use it as secondary. Uh, Huel, do you know Huel Robinson? He, he's here, um, he uses it as secondary. Debbie Kidd, she uses it as secondary. There are others, but it's much less used at secondary. Um, it's used with adults, so I think my answer really is yes, but w but with quite a lot of reservation in terms of because you if you took it on and as an idea, it would be something that you'd explore in your own classroom. Because it has been it has some storytelling that it's, it lends itself to things like protein synthesis, right. but it's traditional storytelling in that yeah. the kids come up with their own story that could be something ridiculous like from their own imagination, like some sort of medieval sort of thing going on where mm. they're actually doing protein synthesis in a completely different context. So right. As well. Yes. But I've not done anything. No. I think I can help you with that one. With protein synthesis, it's probably, if you're going to do the imagination bit, you might be better off doing it as a disease. Yeah. So getting them to think of it as the doctor who is the expert in that disease and using it that way. So then they have to become an expert in the knowledge of protein synthesis, what happens, then genetics as well, and it all plays in, and you can pull it mm. from lots of different areas, mm -hmm. using it that way, making them to know like a doctor or a scientist that way, mm. and you're pulling all the different areas from it. I'm absolutely sure you're right. I'm positive, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I, think, I don't know many people who've used it with children of that age in that way. Yeah. I was just going to mention, Matthew Moss High School in Rochdale um, do this with science. Mm -hmm. So it might work on might work on tapping them. Matthew, sorry. It's Matthew Moss High School in Rochdale. Right. Fantastic. Um, um, the first project with, with a group of students who are doing this inquiry is yeah. and they're quite popular. Yes, I think you're right, yeah. 
Are they are they more sort of simulations rather than where it's something that's set up in order for them to be involved in it? Is that yes, but they usually take on a story like um, they're in an act more than a simulation. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've seen it with fourteen and fifteen year olds producing a Shakespeare play okay. for parents and taking on all the roles. You know, the costume designer, the yeah. choreographer, etc., etc. Okay. The teacher. Yeah. Takes whatever role the children. Right. Fantastic. Yeah. Yes. Obviously. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, we do a lot of physical engagement and active learning. Yes. Um, you know, you think historically back in the years, people learned by doing things. They didn't learn by sitting down and reading or watching. It was mainly doing things. You know, well, what I, what I hear, I forget. What I see, I remember. What I do, I know. Sort of mantra. And that the other hidden benefit of this is these children are being physically engaged in yes, what they're doing. Absolutely. And that does spill over to the health benefits. But, but they are, you know, role play is downgrading it. Yeah. I think it, yeah. it goes beyond that they're totally involved. They're yeah. not just theoretically involved. No. And that that's what the difference is. Absolutely. And Bruno, Bruno talks about this in terms of three forms of representation, which is the, the uh, iconic symbolic enactive. So the inactive form being the form that we use with our bodies when we actually step into something is an important way that we, we represent the world, an important way we make meaning, but it's something that tends to sort of not be, I mean, I'm, I'm generalising, but in, in early years, children learn uh, predominantly through enacting, you know, being involved, and if I'm using Matt as the expert with a group of children in reception, you know, you want to be up and doing stuff pretty quick, because they just didn't switch off a lot. But as children get older, that becomes less and less a part of their learning. So I'm agreeing absolutely with what you're saying. It seems to me it does work 